Oxford High School at the end of 2021, Michigan State University at the beginning of 2023. Two mass shootings in our state just 15 months apart, and that's what prompted the, the push for gun reform in our state. And this conversation we're having today. We have Representative Brian Poshimus, the House Republican floor leader, and Senator Winnie Brinks, the Democratic Senate Majority Leader. Thank you both for, for being here today. It's an important conversation, one that people are sometimes maybe afraid to have. Right. So we're going to have it, and uh, I think we're going to learn a lot today. These four new laws, well, there's several new laws dealing with four main objectives. Those objectives are um, universal background checks, safe storage, uh, red flag laws, and limits on domestic abusers. And these laws are going into effect exactly one year after the Michigan State University shooting. Could have gone into effect sooner had Republicans not voted against uh, these bills. And so I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, the argument I hear a lot is that laws like these infringe on the rights of responsible gun owners. What rights are we talking about? So, so that, that's part of it, but it, it goes deeper than that, right? So uh, I've, I voted against all of the bills in, in all of the packages. And, uh, you know, first of all, let me start by saying we all agree that there's an issue. We mm -hmm. all agree that there is an issue with gun violence here in Michigan and, and across the country. Uh, Senator Brinks and I both agree mm -hmm. on that. The question is, what are the solutions? And from my perspective, this, this was a very difficult vote to take. This wasn't something that I went into lightly. And when I face difficult votes, I have to look at it from the lens of two things. One, does it address the, the root cause of the issue? And two, what are the foundational principles that we're standing on? And to me, it didn't pass the muster on either of those two issues. What, what was it missing, I guess, in your mind? So on the first one, does it, does it address the root cause of the issue? Uh, I don't personally believe metal and plastic is the root cause of the issue. Uh, the, the percentage of households uh, that possess guns has not increased over the last 70 years, but gun violence has skyrocketed. So access to guns is not the, the crux of the issue. It's a mental health issue along with, uh, coupled with societal challenges that we need to face. And so that's why Republicans have been focused on those areas. Do you agree with this interpretation of the new laws that are going into effect that, that maybe they don't address the, the root cause of this or do they go pretty far in addressing at least some symptom of these mass shootings? So I would just start out with uh, saying, you know, I'm not just a political leader here or a leader in our state government, but I'm also a mom. Uh, and I had a child who was on campus a year ago during the MSU shooting. Um, I also have three children who have gone through um, just, I can't even begin to say how many uh, active shooter drills in their schools. My husband's a teacher who has to supervise uh, those active shooter drills. And um, I'm glad to acknowledge, uh, to hear the representative acknowledge that mental health is a big concern. It really is. Um, and the mental health of our students having to live with that constant threat mm -hmm. uh, is unacceptable. Uh, the mental health burden that we have uh, placed on teachers is unacceptable. The mental health burdens that we see in community in general uh, among parents who have to drop their kids off at school after there's been an incident uh, and the fear that those kids feel on a daily basis for something that is preventable to some extent uh, if we pass laws like this, uh, and safe storage is one of those key things. Uh, and I think that responsible gun owners understand this doesn't infringe on their right mm -hmm. to own a weapon. It does say we expect you to be responsible with that, uh, and it sets a, a norm. Uh, it gives law enforcement tools. It gives physicians tools to help prevent harm that could come if that weapon is to um, accidentally fall into someone else's hands or be stolen. Uh, those gun locks and, and uh, uh, efforts to keep weapons stored safely can prevent a, a world of hurt and all of these tragic things. So um, I guess it's fundamental, uh, um, his fundamental argument, we obviously disagree or we would not have ad advanced those mm -hmm. bills. I would also point out that 
most Americans disagree with his perspective. And we saw 80 and 90 percent of people in opinion research polls saying that they were in favor of these bills. And they've been demanding for uh, over a decade right here in Michigan that we do something about it. Um, so I'm just really um, uh, pleased that we were in a position to finally get something done this past year. Yeah, especially with, with the first two, the universal background checks and safe storage laws. These are usually referred to as common sense pieces of gun reform, why doesn't it seem like Republicans agree with that term, common sense, bare right. minimum? Right. So, uh, you know, first, let's, let's talk about the, the safe storage. Uh, you know, I, I own guns. Every single one of my guns is, is safely stored in a, in a locked safe, uh, and, and I'm a proponent of that. The question is enforceability, right? How do we enforce safe storage? I mean, we've already found that, uh, that somebody can be held responsible for the death of somebody uh, somebody else based on their responsible management or irresponsible management of a gun in the mother of the of the Oxford shooting case right and and so how are we going to uh, how, how are we going to enforce safe storage is it random checks with by the police just randomly come in hey just want to check out are you storing your, your gun safely so it, it's it's not that it's it's not about common sense it's about enforceability and while while some of these policies as a general topic had wide margins of support uh, the extreme nature of them don't I mean the fact that you can shop for a judge throughout the state of Michigan that fits your uh, fits your fits your ideal uh, doesn't that doesn't make sense why why should an issue that happens in Kent County be able to go to Ann Arbor right why can we yeah, yes healthcare professionals should be able to look into this but not healthcare professionals outside of Michigan that may have no bearing in the decision making process right those are all parts of this legislation and it that's not the common sense legislation that we're talking about you're, you're referring to the red flag laws right. obviously there um, extreme risk protection orders the way the way I understand it uh, is that you know it, it's opening it up to not just law enforcement and mental health professionals to approach a judge to get such an order now it's family members people have, who have lived with someone who might be at risk but just because you're presenting a judge with that information doesn't necessarily mean they're automatically going to take their guns. There's a whole process they have to right. go through first, and that process isn't permanent. Those guns would be taken away for at most a year until that order could be renewed. Um, so I, I, I don't know how you feel about these red flag laws. Are they as extreme as, as Poshimus is making no, them out to be? certainly not. Um, you know, they are simply tools that can be used by professionals and family members, people who can be in a position, people who are in a position where they've seen um, uh, someone exhibit behavior or um, you know, threaten to harm themselves or others, where they can take a common sense measure with due process built in with a judge right here in Michigan who understands the law here in Michigan to enforce the law here in Michigan uh, and to be able to determine whether or not it is an appropriate action to take. So this is not just about um, uh, you know, safe storage to keep kids from having accidents. It's also about preventing people from all kinds of tragic uh, incidents involving firearms. Things like suicide and domestic violence. All of those things are part of this picture. Uh, and so um, you know, I'm not real sure uh, where you were going with all of that in terms of uh, mental health professionals in other, other places. The fact of the matter is if there's somebody in Michigan with a concern and a mental health concern uh, and, they're brought, uh, and the case is brought in front of a judge and there's um, a reasonable uh, response to that by saying, hey, let's remove this weapon from, from the situation temporarily. Uh, and make sure that everybody is safe, that people get the help that they need. I think we see um, a lot of families and a lot of individuals who will be grateful for that in retrospect as well. Mm. Uh, on the note of, of this, uh, you know, mental health as well, I want to read a quote from a clinical psychologist I just spoke with on this topic. Uh, she said, I would be willing to bet anything that there are no active shooter instances where there were not lots and lots of warning signs. The reverse, however, is not true, and that's what makes it so difficult. Lots of people make threats, Lots of people exhibit warning signs who never act on them. So, uh, Senator Brinks, how do we balance protecting people's rights but also protecting 
the public from gun violence at the same right. time. Right. You have to think about what is our responsibility to members of the general public. When somebody is exhibiting dangerous behaviors, the people around them have a right to expect to be able to be safe. Uh, and we should have tools in place to prevent them as well as any other person in their environment who may or may not know them from harm. Uh, it is not an unreasonable expectation to ask a few questions to ensure, again, due process if there's any um, uh, concern there. But to ask those questions is reasonable. And I think we saw that borne out in um, uh, the case we saw in with the uh, Oxford shooter's mom. Uh, they had exhibited so many warning signs and there was a refusal to get help. Um, we also have this situation where there's not as many tools as there needs to be. We're trying to fix that. So, uh, you know, this goes both ways in terms of having responsible people who own guns, but then responsible people around those people mm -hmm. as well to protect the entire community, and that's a right too. And this isn't the first time, obviously, won't be the last time we're talking about gun reform in the state, but actually these specific pieces of legislation we're looking at right now that are going into effect Republicans had a chance to put them into law and, and help prevent possible future mass shootings after the Oxford High School shooting um, when Republicans led the yep. legislature. Uh, the bills were blocked, but now that Democrats are in charge of the state legislature, these same bills were, were passed and signed into law. So um, if Republicans were still in charge of the legislature mm -hmm. after two mass shootings, would we even be up here talking about gun reform right now, or would we still be back in the same boat? Well, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, under under the, the last Speaker of the House, Jason Wentworth, uh, he, he created a, a uh, school safety task force headed by Representative Luke Meerman here, from here in, in West Michigan. And that task force, while it was a long process that ultimately uh, oversaw, like, continued on after the transition to the Democrats taking control, came out with a, 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 a lot of legislation that was bipartisan legislation, good legislation that addressed mental health issues and also school safety. And we introduced that, it was bipartisan, led by Representative Meerman. We introduced that long before uh, the, the shooting at Michigan State University. And that still hasn't come up for a vote. Uh, and, and so we have been proactive on these issues of keeping schools safe and also addressing the mental health crisis in our state. Uh, and and I'm, I'm hopeful that we will see a vote on that bipartisan package and, and that it will make it over to the leader's mm -hmm. chamber where they can bring it up as well. Uh, I, I want to read another quote from you from one of your Senate counterparts uh, who said, someone who is truly determined to commit evil will succeed in harming themselves or others, and there's no law we can pass here in this body that will forever prevent that. So if that is the case, what, what would laws like these even accomplish? I refuse to give up hope that we actually have some agency here in creating our uh, creating safer communities for our kids and for everybody. Um, we drive cars. We understand that there's a certain amount of risk with that. We still put on seatbelts. We still have traffic laws. We still ask people to drive safely. There are things that we can do that we are doing now in the state of Michigan after years and years of having absolutely no conversation about it in the legislature other than a work group that recommended some things. And a lot of things, they're fine, but they pick around the edges. They didn't get at the core root. There's a huge problem in our society, and it's unique to the United States, that we have a, just an incredible amount of gun violence that is present and pervasive on a daily basis in our communities. And if we fail to address guns, how they're stored, how they're used, who has access to them, we are failing our communities. So I refuse to accept that, well, this isn't going to help, this argument that this isn't going to help anyway. Then why do you even go to work every day in the legislature? Because we are constantly trying to see problems in our communities, introduce policy and legislation or uh, funding to help solve those problems. This is no different. We have an obligation to the community that we serve and to our state to address this. Uh, it's the number one killer of children by accidents, right? Surpassing uh, even car accidents. 
we cannot keep our heads in the sand on that. Uh, and as lawmakers and legislators, we know we've seen these these kinds of policies pass uh, in other states. They are making a difference in reducing gun violence in all of its ugly forms, whether it's suicide, domestic violence, accidents, and tragically, school shootings. So we, it's simply unacceptable to just throw your hands up and say, well, this isn't going to do any good. Is there any sort of gun reform that Republicans would support? Uh, you know, I, I think we need to focus on on the root cause. So there's a, there's we have to look at long term solutions. And we have to look at short term solutions. That that's my my view on this. Mm -hmm. And from a short term solution, I look at still mental health addre addressing mental health issues. That is a, the the primary focus for the long term solution. But it also touches a short term solution. Mm -hmm. Also with with short term solution, we need to focus on uh, making our schools safer. We need we I mean the there was a nine billion dollar budget surplus. And, and I was advocating for armed security guards in every school in, in Michigan. And we, couldn't, we blew through a $9 billion budget surplus without, without doing that. So if we're not keeping our kids in schools safe in the short term, then, then what, are, what are we doing? What are we doing with our money if that's not happening? And, and so that's where I, need to, where I think we need to be focusing, the root cause. The root cause is not metal and plastic. The root cause is the mental health issue and, and the societal issues uh, like, like the standard of living and cost of living and things of that nature. So Republicans won't touch guns themselves, just the mental health side? That's where I would focus. Okay. Um, is there anything you feel Democrats can do a better job of meeting Republicans halfway on their efforts to address what he calls the root cause here? Okay, so if you take a look at the budget that we passed last year with the, the, um, you know, the, the unprecedented amount of dollars that we had to apply to um, all, of, all manner of government um, programming and schools and uh, mental health health care, community investment, roads and infrastructure, you name it, the entire budget, um, you will see strategic investments in things like mental health, in things like medical care, in things like housing, in things like uh, um, education, higher education, early childhood, all the way through higher education, so that we can help people have better lives, we can reduce some of those uh, uh, negative impacts from not having their needs met uh, in these other areas. Um, the, the budget uh, did not go to arming guards in schools for a very good reason. Schools are not prisons. We shouldn't expect uh, our teachers or our students to have to go to school in a place where we are going to acknowledge that we just accept that gun violence is part of our new reality when it does not need to be. If we can keep guns out of the hands of children. here, Right here in Grand Rapids, we had young students coming to school with weapons that were unsecured in their home, in their backpacks. We can prevent that with some of these simple policy solutions like safe storage. So it's one of those very simple things that we can do. It retains people's rights to own a gun responsibly and it can save uh, that, th that school, that child, that classroom from a tragic incident. It also, by the way, addresses all kinds of reasons for negative impacts on mental health that we see in schools. Every time after a school shooting, anywhere near here, you have parents who are really hesitant to bring their kids to school. You have children who are crying in the morning or at night because they're worried about going to school because they saw it on the news, right? We're seeing child-sized coffins, and it's not unusual, right? It's no longer unusual. We have to be able to address the mental health needs of the stress created by the constant risk that children, teachers, parents are all feeling around this issue. We are doing that with our resources. The, it simply is not a viable answer to say we can't do anything. It's not a viable answer to say we just have to arm more people and put more guns in the, in the situation. Uh, more guns is not going to be the solution to gun violence. The, these opposing views between Republicans and Democrats, it's not a uniquely Michigan uh, issue. This is something we know is happening nationwide. Why does it seem like it's so difficult to address gun reform and mental health at the same time? 
Are, are you're looking at me, so sure, I assume yeah, I you're asking me first, that question. Yeah. Uh, I'll well, ask, but this is going to be for both of you, but yeah, I guess no, I'll start with you. Uh, I, again, so you, you have you have two separate issues, but at the same time, they, they impact each other, right? Like the, the large volume of, uh, of gun-related violence in the state and in the country has to do with mental health. I believe that is one of the primary fundamental issues at play. And, and so we do need to work on that. And, and that is, in my opinion, that is fundamentally addressing gun violence in the state of Michigan. Uh, and, and again, what it comes down to is uh, the, the leader had mentioned that, um, the, the leader had mentioned that a large number of a large percentage of people supported some of these policies, but they didn't support the extreme nature of them. I mean, look look at look at the uh, the red flag laws. Somebody that went to college 15 years ago and had a had a fight with their roommate that could be brought up again, and then they could shop for a specific judge in a area that they know that judge wants to just get rid of guns. It, like that's that's just that specific judge, and so they can pick out that judge and have that judge make the determining factor here. You know, and, and when we're looking at the Michigan State shooting, right, all of these, all of these policies was a, was a reaction to the Michigan State shooting, and yet not a single one of these policies would have done anything to touch the Michigan State shooting. But what would have is if the, if the laws that are already on the books were enforced. That's, that's the only thing that would have prevented it. None of this would have. And so that's what we have to be focusing on. You don't think the father of the Michigan State school shooter who knew his son was in his own world at that point could have alerted a judge about the fact that he legally owned a couple of guns and maybe could have had them out of his taken out of his possession? So prior to the red flag laws uh, legislation passing, there are aspects of the mental health code that address that very thing. It, there, there are. It's, there were already laws on the books that address that. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, he wasn't reported, so no, the red flag laws wouldn't have to, wouldn't have addressed it. Uh, it and, but what would have is if the prosecutor would have actually prosecuted, if the prosecutor several years prior would have prosecuted him with a proper crime that he had committed earlier in his life, he wouldn't have been able to access a gun. Fact of the Response. matter is, law enforcement, physicians, teachers, therapists are all requesting these kinds of tools to help them help their patients, to help them help people who are coming to them with concerns about family members. We know that these things can make a difference. We can't speak to exactly what would have happened in Oxford or in MSU if these laws had been in place or if they would have been properly used or um, uh, you know, activated in these particular situations. But we know that we can help prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future. So of course, back to your original question, we can address mental health and gun violence. And they're going to take um, uh, approaches from both ends. The mental health stuff that we constantly hear people talk about is very real, right? Um, we need to put more resources into that, and we've been working toward that. We need to equip more people to help um, the general public with those mental health needs. It's a small fraction of those folks who actually end up committing gun violence, right? We can use these tools from the law enforcement side, from the judicial side, to protect people's rights and protect people themselves who own guns, from uh, hurting themselves or their family members, we can also protect the communities around them. And it's not just uh, a matter of saying, well, if we only address mental health, all this gun violence will go away. It won't. We need to have responsible laws around gun ownership and around how they are stored, around who has access to them, around um, uh, background checks so that we can ensure that folks who have questionable backgrounds don't get those to begin with. Um, so it, it's simply unacceptable to do nothing. And it's simply unacceptable to say this is simply a mental health problem. It's not. It's more complex than that. We have tools in place now. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to see them actually in place and in, uh, um, in effect uh, next week. 
Um, it could have been sooner had we had support from uh, the Republicans in the minority, uh, particularly in the Senate, uh, as you mentioned at the top of the program. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really pleased to see that now they will finally go into effect. We'll end with this um, on a little lighter note, I guess. For both of you, is there anything that you think Republicans, and I'll ask you conversely with Democrats, mm -hmm. but is there anything that you think Republicans do well when it comes to addressing um, gun violence and this issue at hand in our state? You know, normally with almost any other topic, it would be easy for me to find some, th some things that I could say we've worked really well together on certain aspects of conversation about this. The fact of the matter is, uh, you know, these bills are not just a result of one um, school shooting or two here in Michigan. They are the result of years of advocacy that went completely unheard uh, by Republicans in the majority in the legislature, despite uh, you know, and not just the activists, the moms demanding action, folks in red shirts showing up in our offices, but polling showing that 80 and 90 percent of the population would like to see something done on this. So um, this is one of those areas where it really was critical that we had a shift in power in the legislature, that we had people who were finally willing to take action on this, to pass meaningful legislation, and to put in place these common sense reforms. And I have no faith that that would have happened had we not uh, been able to see this shift in power and have Democrats actually calling the shots and putting those bills up on the board, finally. So the short answer is no. So that's the short answer, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I, would, I would say the, the Democrats do a very good job of ushering in extreme gun control measures and painting it as common sense. I would say that's what they do very well. Okay, so it sounds like we're, we're in a way on the same page this. for different reasons, <laughs> yes. Well, in either case, I appreciate you both taking the time to, to sit here and have this discussion. Uh, yes, everything goes into effect on Tuesday, yeah. and I'm sure this obviously will not be the last time we continue to revisit everything.